I'll turn it over to Mike to introduce our first uh, speaker. Well, thanks, Sean. Um, good, good afternoon or morning, everyone, depending on where you are in the, um, in the U.S. Uh, this is Mike Robotham. I'm the National Leader for Soil Interpretations and soon to be National Leader for Technical Soil Services once some paperwork gets processed and some other things along those lines. Um, thanks for tuning into our webinar. We're, um, we're going to talk about technical soil services activity reporting. That's going to be our major topic. Um, but first, uh, Dave Smith, who many of you know, along the, have met along the way, but some may have not met in his current capacity. And his new capacity is our, as the director of the Soil Science Division, has uh, graciously agreed to join us and um, say a few words. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Dave. Okay, thanks, Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to just touch bases with you. I'm starting here just at the start of my third week as the new division director for the Soil Science Division. So it's a good opportunity to just say a few words. And thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a few words about the role of technical soil services and the restructured soils program and the inter interaction between the two. Um, you know, state soil scientists and resource soil scientists are not, as you all know, directly supervised by the soil science division in our new restructured program, but that's really nothing new. That's the way it's always been. Uh, so what I wanted to say about that is that the, the soil science division uh, will continue as the soil survey division always has as a partner, as a, as a team, uh, you know, to deliver your technical soil services. Uh, the soil survey offices underneath the supervision of the regional offices, uh, if you haven't already heard, uh, part of the restructure includes a portion of the regional and soil survey office time uh, dedicated to the support of technical soil services. And I see that as being something that will be coordinated through the state soil finance position in each state. So, somebody's phone ringing, it sounds like. Um, you know, so really, we're, the, the message I just want to give is that that group together, state soil scientists, resource soil scientists, and the soil scientists working together in the, in the soil survey offices and regional offices, will comprise one team to deliver uh, the use and application of soil survey information and soil science uh, in the NRCS programs in the states. And I think we all agree that that's a critically important very critically important thing for, for our overall program to deliver technical services. So we're all on board in this together. And you know that's really all I wanted to say. Uh, I'll add to what Mike said about uh, title changes. We are, you know, Chris Smith has served in the past as National Leader for Technical Soil Services and we're doing uh, some minor uh, adjustment in names and functionality and Chris's position is moving to uh, the senior scientist position of the soil science division and uh, the leadership for technical services is moving over with Mike at the National Soil Service Center on interpretation. We're still toying around with exactly how to title that position. Um, but uh, both individuals will be uh, intimately interconnected in the technical services delivery side of things as well. So this isn't really leading that because as a senior scientist, uh, that relates in a big way to, to everything we do, technical services. So with that, I'm going to be quiet and pass this back on to Mike. Uh, thanks, Dave. Appreciate you taking some time to get on. And um, actually, it's a wonderful segue into what, um, what we wanted to talk about today. So, um, and we didn't even rehearse that. So <laughs> much appreciated. Well, without further ado, um, Let's move forward with the topic of the day. And um, so technical cell services activity reporting. Um, and I'll find it. Sean's teaching me how to use this thing. Okay. What do we got? 
I'm going to go down. Here? Sorry, folks, my technical difficulties. Okay. I messed up the screen on my laptop, so here we go. There we go. Okay, minor technical difficulties, but we're fixed. Um, we always like to start these webinars and, and everything else with um, with a reminder of kind of who we are and what we're about. And so, I won't dwell on this, but this is this is a somewhat obligatory slide on the core, on the core missions of the soil survey and the soil science program. And what I want to highlight with this, you've all seen this two dozen times and in pretty much every presentation, but um, but that is that providing technical assistance in the use of the soil survey and soil survey products is an explicit mention of an explicit part of our core mission. It's, it, it is part of what we're about. We are about more than inventory. We are about getting that information in the hands of people who can use it and helping them use it appropriately, correctly, effectively, and all that good stuff. So no news to anybody on the teleconference, but just good to remind ourselves on a regular basis. I get asked this question a lot, and Chris did a lot. Chris did a lot. Now I seem to be getting asked a lot: is what the heck is tech, does technical soil services mean anyway? And so I dug around in the um, technical soil services handbook and tried to come up with a definition. And what you see on your screen is what I got. Um, it's too long and a little complicated, but it gets at the main points. And the the key things I'd like to highlight are that the TSS or technical soil services are any and all activities that assist customers. And this is customers broadly defined. Um, they can be internal customers. They can be our conservationists. They can be other technical staff. They can be conservation district cooperators. They can be you know, people who are internal to our organization, also people who are external to our organization. That could be city and county government. It could be another federal agency. It could be private citizens. So pretty much anybody with understanding and properly using soil survey data and information or and or providing users with predictions and interpretations about the behavior of soils mapped or identified under defined situations. So as you can see from this, it pretty much covers soup to nuts. And most of what the vast majority of us who are soil scientists in RCS, a good chunk of what we do, the folks who are there are folks who are still mapping full time, but for the vast majority of us, what we do probably fits under this definition someplace, or at least a good chunk of our time does. You all know what um, what you're doing. I think most of the people on the call have had some experience with TSS. Um, I'm now sitting used to be in Hawaii, where this wasn't a huge big deal. Now I'm here in the heart of the Midwest, where this is a huge deal, and that's wetland determinations and delineations. Um, the um, obviously resource soil scientists assist in conservation plan resource inventories and a whole lot of other stuff related to conservation planning, on-site investigations, um, maintaining and updating the FOTG, working with your fellow staff on cost lists and practice standards and a whole slew of other things. Um, resource soil scientists often provide training. They provide information. And the list goes on. So it's, it's a lot of things. We know everybody's doing a lot of great stuff, and that's part of why we're, a big part of why we're here today. So given that we're doing all this great stuff, the, the, title, of the, the title of this webinar is Reporting TSS, or Recording TSS. I'll, I'll use the two terms interchangeably. Um, basically, it's writing down what you're doing so that we can figure out what you did. You, you and your boss and us and other folks who are interested can figure out what you did. And why do we need to do that? Well, the reality is, folks, that we need to get credit for and we need to sell. And I, and I use that term sell deliberately. The great work that all of you are doing. And that's at the local level, the state level, and the national level. People are doing a lot of great stuff out there to help people better manage land and help people make better decisions, and we aren't getting credit for that. And we need to get credit for that, and we need to sell it, because, as you all know, you all watch the news, you all listen to the radio, the budgets are tight. There's a, people are competing for money. 
there's a limited amount of resources, and we need to show that what we're doing is valuable. We need to show our own people, and we need to show people external to the agency. That includes Congress. That includes, you know, the people in the big uh, the, the people in the big White House at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. That's some that we're a valuable and important thing that needs to be supported. We also need to document that that time is being spent appropriately and effectively. If we're asking for money and we think what we're doing is important, those folks have a right to know what we're doing and when we're doing it and how we're doing it and are we doing it effectively and are we doing it efficiently and what's being, what are the outcomes of those activities. That's fair enough. Um, Dave mentioned, and most of you are aware, if you are one of the folks on the line who is on an MLRA Social Survey Office staff, in the new reorganization, there was a deliberate, there was a deliberate decision that all MLRA Social Survey Office staff have 15% of their time allocated to technical social services. Might be a good idea to document that in case somebody asks. And for those of you who are state soil, soil scientists on this call, or assistant state soil scientists, or even or resource soil scientists, state conservationists, and area directors are asking how state and local soil staff are supporting CPA and Farm Bill. There's only so much money to go around. There are only so many positions to go around. People are asking questions. We need to have good answers. And why now? I just talked about this. The budgets are tight. And I'll hit the last one, that consistent and reliable reporting will also allow for more accurate and efficient planning and allocation of staff and financial resources. If money's tight, if we know where the work is, if we know who's doing the work, if we know what work needs to be done, then we can make better decisions as to where new positions should be located, how responsibilities should be shared, how responsibilities should be divided so that we can get the most work done, most bang for the buck, get people working more efficiently and effectively. I know this is pretty much boilerplate, and I'm not telling you folks anything you don't already know, but I think it's good to remind ourselves that you know, we're doing great stuff, and I'm going to say that a dozen times because I, I honestly and earnestly believe that there is a lot of neat stuff going on out there, a tremendous amount of neat stuff going on out there that just isn't getting recorded. I'll give you an example. We were trying to put together the national report for this year for technical soil services. We collected the data we could. We had data from 15 states. Now, yeah, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not naming names. Don't intend to. But... That's not going to do it, folks. When I'm as national leader of technical soil services being asked those questions about why TSS is worthy of support, when your state con's asking your state soil scientist, or if you are the state soil scientist, your state con's asking you what's going on, we can do, we can do better than that, and we need to do better than that. So you ask, if we're supposed to report this, where could we report it? And I'm going to use the word please because I'm national leader. I have, you know, I have, I, have, I have position and no power, folks. Um, the, um, but I'm going to strongly suggest, I'm going to beg and plead, depending on my mood today, that, I'm going to, that we use the NASA 6.2 Technical Soil Services Table. Now, as everybody says, NASA, oh, no, it's NASA. Let me, let me hold, hold up for a second and let me give you some reasons why, this is a, why, this be, why, is, why, I think, why we think this will be a good idea. Reason number one is that it's available for use now. It's on the shelf. It's technology that's available. We're sitting here at November 19th. We're a month and a half into FY 2013. We need to be reporting, and this is available. You can start using NASA 6.2 if you aren't already. You can start using it today. It is easy to use. And that's Bob Dobos, for those of you who heard the intake of breath over there. Um, but I can assure you, and I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step process here that even a national leader could do, that you don't need to be a skilled NASA user, and it only takes a few minutes to enter an activity. Um, it provides a consistent data input format that allows data to be sorted and reported in multiple ways. And I'll put on my national leader hat here, um, same with state soil scientists, you know, I need to provide a national report, and if data is stored in six different ways and trying to pull that all together and provide a national report that means anything is really, really difficult. 
if we can get so that we're using one place to put the data and we're inputting the same set of data, it makes that a lot easier. Same thing on the state level. And the NASA 6.2 Tech Services table is set up such that it provides additional data collection and reporting options for local use. What I'm going to present today is the minimum data set for what I'm looking for as the national leader so that I can prepare a reasonable national report. What you need to work out in your state with state soil scientists, what the MOs need to work out is, are there other things? I'm going to present the minimum data set. There's lots of other things you can have. There's lots of other information that can be stored. You're going to have to work that out locally. Maybe you need additional information that I don't need at the national level. That's great. And the, and NASA's, the NASA's TSS table has that capability. Now, I've got a little note here myself that some, that someone may ask, well, well, I don't have NASA's or I don't have a NASA's login. Well, that may be true. Um, you might find out because a lot of people have NASA's logins and don't know it. So it, you, you may have one even if you're, even if you don't think you do. Um, if NASA's isn't on your computer, you're certainly welcome to get it. And that's a matter of working with your local IT to get that done. Um, as far as the login goes, the uh, great folks at the hotline, Tammy and Steve, if you do find that you don't have a login, get in touch with Tammy and Steve. Just call up the hotline or drop the hotline an email, and they'll get you set up. And we move forward from that. There also has to be a little bit of coordination at the MO level to get you into a group. But again, that's very easily done, and our um, MO database manager types would be happy to do that for you. And that'll, that's a very, a very simple and painless process. One of the nice things about NASA is if you haven't used it for a while, since we moved from 5.4 to 6 point X, is that now it works on your e-authentication. So you don't even have to remember a new password. All you got to do is it's all tied into your e-authentication. So. Now, what I do want to say, and I think I just I skipped over this, but um, as we're selling why we're doing this, I forgot, and Chris, wanted to, Chris had a couple things he wanted to mention from the national level to talk about why this reporting is important. So before I get into the details of exactly what we're going to report in NASA, so I just, I'm going to give, um, give Chris a quick, second, quick minute or two to jump in if he's got anything I forgot. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, well, you, you covered uh, four or five bullets I was going to relay, so thanks. Um, but um, this, this reporting system was requested from, from Resource Source Science oh, maybe as much as eight years ago when Russ Kelsey was uh, in the chair that I was in and now Mike or both of them is in. And they had a pilot project going, and there was a lot of comment from, from the pilot uh, participants. And then uh, I added and some others uh, added additional categories to the system. So. We, we wanted to keep the system reasonably simple and somewhat broad because, you know, you can get into the weeds on exactly the kind of service you provided, and we don't want to go there. I don't think we need to go there. Of course, we can always change our minds and, and uh, amend the system later. But uh, we want to keep it fairly broad. Up here at the, at the uh, national level headquarters here, uh, they want to keep the reporting system so simple that uh, a lot of this stuff just wouldn't wouldn't show up. They wouldn't even look at it. So uh, if we got into the weeds anymore, so it's not. And, and the system, our reporting is is not reflected in PRS. It's not reflected in this thing called CONSTAT, conservation stat status. I think is what it's short for. That's the national headquarters reporting system. So what we do isn't showing up, guys. And so this is the way it shows up. We, we, we can, if we have a nice consistent system uh, that y'all are putting into, and um, that's all y'all, I think some people say that back here, um, then we can generate a national report. And, and it's a custom report, and it goes straight to the chief, and it goes straight to the deputy chiefs and the regional conservationists. And then you folks can download your own state's worth of information for your state's not. I think Mike mentioned that already. But anyway, so so that's the idea. And uh, but but uh, like Mike said, we uh, I guess last year, year before last, we got 38 states reporting. This year we got 15. Um, we can't mandate this this reporting is done. But 
um, we're sure big and complete. And uh, also, while I've got the floor, um, if you have other sort of resourceful science out there that are not on this teleconference in your state, maybe they work for the AC, um, try to, to uh, I, are, we're going to post this, right, uh, Mike? Yeah, Sean, it, and we'll, I mean, it'll be posted on the webinar site, Sean said. Maybe. Okay, fine. So, so maybe, maybe encourage, uh, you know, others that aren't in on this teleconference uh, to, to uh, get on board with reporting, and uh, I'll let it go with that and turn it back to Mike. Hey, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. So, um, so yeah, so that, like, like Chris is saying, you know, we all – we know this is needed, and we're going to try to present this as a pretty simple and straightforward process that isn't going to be too much extra work. I mean, I'm not lying. It's going to take an extra couple of minutes, but I don't think it's going to take a whole lot more than that. So let's move on to some details. After much, I'm gritty, you know, hemming and hawing and gnashing of teeth and discussing and everything else. Um, the TSS group, which is basically Chris and I and Lenore and some other folks, came up with the, um, the list you see on your screen as the required minimum data set from the national level. Now, I use the word required, just like what Chris told you. We can't require nothing. However, I'll call it the strongly suggested. Call it the pretty please. Call it the it would really help if you um, data set. And we've tried to keep this to a minimum to make this reporting as, as um as simple and less and least onerous as possible. And so I want to present this list. I'll quick walk through it now, and then we're going to go through step-by-step step of how you file an activity report with the NASA system. Um, date completed. We need to know when you did this. Tech soil services type, we'll talk about that. That's a choice list. These are these broad categories that Chris was talking about. And again, at the national level, we're reporting broad categories. We're not, they don't want the gory details. They want broad categories. Um, instances, how often? Once, twice, five times. The provider, well, that'd be you. Um, the recipient, again, it's a category, broad categories. Internal customers, conservation planners, state and local government, big categories, again, for reporting purposes. Program benefited. As all of us are aware, since 1985, Farm Bill programs are a big deal, and they're a big deal for the agency. And the more we can show how soil scientists and resource soil scientists are assisting in the implementation of Farm Bill programs, the better off we're going to be. We'd like you to take your best shot at populating one or more of three quantitative measures. Right now, the three quantitative measures in the system are plans affected, acres benefited, and people served. Now, this is going to be a best judgment call. Some things are going to be pretty obvious. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Some things are going to be harder. It's a best professional judgment call on how many acres you think this is impacted by this activity, how many people. Plans tend to be a bit easier if you aren't working on it with a cooperator with the conservation planner and you're out working on an equip plan, well, that's one plan. That tends to be pretty straightforward. If you're not working on a conservation plan, well, that'd be zero plans. Um, the um, two things to note about the um, about populating a table, the uh, if there are, it's a one instance table. So if you did two separate types of technical soil services and you want to document both those types, and you did them on the same day, you need to make two separate entries so both of those get captured. Same thing if you were working with two discrete groups or benefiting two discrete programs. We realize that's a bit of duplication, but that's just the way the system works. The, um, and the second thing that I want to highlight, and we'll talk about this as we work through the table, um, you do not have to fill in everything in the table. Fill in the fields that apply. Fill in these required fields. Leave the rest blank. If they're useful to you, put some information in. If they're not, leave them blank. Don't populate them with zeros. Don't populate them with, you know, your, be with your best guesses. If they don't apply, it's okay to leave them blank. And the database people, I'm going to teach sitting across from me. He's doing the, uh, 
you know, on the database staff took Jim Fortner's old job, and he's nodding profusely with a, in response to that. So. Okay. What I want to spend the next few minutes going over is um, the step-by-step -step process. I, this is a 12-step process. Um, that wasn't on purpose. It just happened that way. And I assure you that this is so, um, so straightforward that even a national leader can do it. And trust me, I am not a power NASIS user. So if I can do this, you can do it. And many thanks to Paul Fennell for a, a bunch of these screenshots. So. So step one, you got to get into NASIS. We talked about what you need to do to get a login if you don't have one. And you open to the Tables Explorer panel. That's on the left side of NASIS. You're going to click on this. I didn't want to, I thought about trying to do this live, but um, after talking with Sean and getting a, what do you mean you thought you, what do you mean you want to do this live look from someone who's tried to do this on these kind of things. And we're going with screenshots. Uh, Sorry about that. It's not quite as good as being there, but it's guaranteed to work, and live demos have a tendency to do bad things. So, Anyway, so you're going to open the Tables Explorer panel. You're going to double-click on the Technical Soil Services table, and a table that looks like the one at the bottom of the screen there is going to open, and you're ready to go. So that table is ready for data to be populated. You can, put data, you can populate data in that table. So, you'll see here at below that there are four date fields. I just mentioned the date completed is required. Um, we need that for consistent reporting. We need that to keep track of fiscal years. Um, sometimes they're interested in distribution of workload. Are we doing everything in the spring, everything in the fall, you know, that kind of thing. So we need date completed. Now, you'll notice we have scheduled start date, scheduled completion date, and date started. If those apply to you, by all means, use them. So I know some states are using um, the NASA's TSS table as a scheduling tool and making good use of the scheduled start and scheduled completion dates. If that's working for you, keep at it. Um, if you have a multiple day activity, date started, date completed might be useful for you to remind you that that activity did take three days. But what we need for national reporting is when did it get done? I mentioned this earlier. Um, this is the TSS type table, and this is a required field. You need to select the TSS type. As you can see, these are very broad categories. Because of the issues Chris mentioned about reporting at the national level, we're trying to keep these categories pretty broad. There's a place to add details, and we'll talk about that later. But if there's something that obviously is missing here, an activity that you do regularly that you just think does not fit in one of these existing categories. Let us know. We can add additional categories. And George Teachman is pointing it himself. So that's um, George Teachman and I as the people you need to let know about, a, um, about the desire for a new category. We'll bounce it around, get some feedback, and most likely we'll put it in for you. Again, we do want to keep these broad. We don't want the point of this list is for concise reporting. We'd like to keep it, you know, in the low double, in the you know, 15 to 20, 25 range, not 50 to 100 range. So, um, so think carefully, and maybe what you're doing does fit in one of these broad categories after all. The um, I talked about the multiple instances. If you have more than one type of activity on the same day in the same place, you do need to do two separate lines. We can't capture A and B. It's going to have to be one entry for A, one entry for B. Um, again, just how the table works. Um, you know, it can't be everything for everybody. Okay. Step five, you got to take credit for this. So you need to select, they call it in the, um, in the field, that's called provider, and it's by a NASA's username. Um, when you click on the little down arrow on that box that you see on your screen, you're going to get the, li the laundry list of everybody with a NASA's username. Um, Note that all NASA's choice lists can be searched by typing into the field. So if you put your cursor on that field and start typing your last name, in my case, Robotham, I start typing RO, and I get a bunch of R's, and then I get to the ROs, and then I get to the Roberts, and then I finally put another O in there, and lo and behold, I'm the only Robotham in the database. So makes it easy. Um, 
If your last name's Smith, probably be a little little more work to find yourself, but you can get it done. The um, the next required field, step six, you need to put a category of recipient. And again, as mentioned with the te with the um, with the technical services type, these are broad categories, general groups of recipients. We can add somebody else if we need to, but we're pretty sure we got almost everybody you could be talking to here. Um, again, if we've missed somebody, if there's a particular reason why a specific subgroup needs to be highlighted for reporting purposes, again, let us know. We can do it. We can make it. We, those, those changes are possible. We just want to make sure we think through and we don't come, um, we don't get too much extraneous stuff in the database. Okay, step seven. Select the program benefited. Can I ask a question? Sure can. Okay. Um, go back to the previous screen. Previous screen. We can do that. Yes. Okay. We didn't know. I, I haven't entered stuff all year. I did like 240 some uh, hey. for appeals, and I didn't enter anything. Good I, deal. Okay. Say. Hey, um, good for good. Good for you. Hey. <laughs> yeah, but didn't capture a dang thing. But when I did it last year, we didn't know where to put it. We were talking with the MLRA guys. Does it go? In, who is benefited when you do it on site? Is it the farm individual? Are you are you benefiting the district office or the conservation district because you're helping, you know, do on sites for the district? Where does it go? Um, and, I, like, and, the, and the acres is it the acres that you did for a 20 acre woodlot, or is the guy's whole track? Maybe he's got 2,000 acres he farms. Yep. You know, we didn't. We, no no direction from anybody. No, I hear you. And that's yeah. No, I I understand completely, and I and I'm not going to be um. You know, I I think what my, what I'll say, and this is a bit of a cop out, I'm, and I and I'll admit to that up front, is the key thing that I would I would say is be consistent. So at your state level, at um, is be consistent. You guys decide that okay, wetlands, wetland determinations. We're going to say that wetland determinations benefit the landowner, then be consistent and yeah, say, okay. Other farm individual. Yeah, another farm individual, exactly. Yeah. If we're going to say, if you're going to say that, I'm good with that. Be consistent. If, you know, that, but that's, that's all I ask. And the same thing with the acres. Again, if you're going to say that, okay, for wetland determinations, it's the entire plan affected. Good on, you know, that's, I, I can't sit here and say that there's A or B. You know, it's be just. I just ask that to be consistent. Um, I, I think. Let me go ahead, Chris. Uh, what was that? Uh, were you saying that the, these are wetland determinations for cooperators? Yeah, for landowners. Yeah, yeah. We 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 have a category there: district cooperator or program recipient. And I think that would be the better choice than the one that I think was just mentioned. Other farm individuals, groups, or organizations. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's just, it's a district cooperator. And that would highlight, and then, yeah, the choice of that one would highlight the program part of this too, because you're doing the delineation most likely because they're working on eligibility or trying to maintain eligibility, correct? Right. Exactly. Yeah, so, so if we I, catch that program recipient, it would probably be a real good one. Can I clear a question here? Sure can. Uh, as fellow research specialists and stuff, we're usually being called out by the local field office personnel. So sometimes, you know, with those wetland determinations, the request is not coming from the landowner. It's coming from a soil conservationist or district conservationist. So what about, you know, that you're benefiting the NRCS local field office? Fair enough. I, like I say, I, my, my point would be my – all I would ask, and, I, and this is – these are big, broad categories. There's some fuzziness here, and I, I can't get around that, um, you know, is – be, you know, make a decision at your local at your local or state level, and stick with it. Right. See, ninety-five percent of the ones I get are because the landowner wants to clear the woods, and that's why he comes in and he fills in an old, you know, a ten twenty-six, and then it gets generated, and then that goes. You know, five sixty-nine where they, you know, found a violation or something. Maybe that's five percent of what it's due. Because NRCS doesn't mm -hmm. ask for the determinations only if there's been violation. Basically, unless it's, unless somebody doesn't have you know a sign up a program that doesn't have uh, a determination done, but that's very seldom. So yeah. That's going to go right to you or through that soil kind of working with the farmer. We don't do that anymore. Um, the 1026 yeah. goes to wetland specialists and they process them. Yeah. Send the letters to the landowner. The landowner 
request a redetermination in the ag law. Okay. Um, good, good discussion. I hate to jump in, but okay. um, but probably something maybe we need to take offline just because I want to make sure we get through this and we're getting a, uh, and I want to keep people past our two o'clock time. So. So yeah, and the other thing is, if you have questions, obviously we're not going to answer everything here on this webinar. So my con you know, my contact information is in the book, as it were. Um, happy to talk with folks offline about specifics, and we can work this out. So yeah, I, I would just end this up by saying you know, that uh, we've talked about uh, creating some fairly well-defined well, definitions. And uh, this might be something we do in another iteration where, where you could click on an item and get, um, um, you know, some metadata behind it for a definition. So yep. we'll, we'll need to work on that, I think, and get it cycled around so that everybody makes sure it's okay. No, exactly. And, I, and I, one of the things I, was, I had meant to say earlier, and I'll say this again, we need, we're in a situation now where we need a process for 2013. This process is available. The process I'm walking through with NASA's is available. We'd like you to give it a shot for 2013. We're certainly welcome. You know, we welcome any and all suggestions about what's needed to make this better, what's needed to make this more user friendly, what's needed to make this clearer. You know, please let us know. And you know, if a set of definitions needs to be worked on, they pull together some people who are interested, come up with some definitions. That's the kind of thing we can do for the future. But um, but for now. Yeah, I just like I'd like to kind of try to get through what we have today, and then um, then we'll move forward with other questions offline if that's if everybody's okay with that. Okay, moving on to step seven, uh, program benefited, fairly self-explanatory. Um, the alphabet soup of programs. Um, most stuff is CTA. You'll see CTA in there, and then the alphabet soup of farm bill programs. Um, Step eight, these are, again, very, very broad categories. Um, pick the one that matches best. If you've got an idea of something else that, that captures these big picture things of, what, of the great work we do, I'm all ears. Let me know. Okay. Oops, skipped one. Okay. The, um, I talked about the instances. Um, instances is often one. Some folks I know are using instances if they talk about technical consultations, analogous to a brief technical consultation. They're just putting one line and using multiple instances and using a range of dates. If that works for you, great. Um, I mentioned the three quantitative indicators we had, plans affected, acres benefited, and people served. Again, I... Our situations we deal with are so diverse that I, I sat around trying to find examples and you know definitive things of when you populate one or the other. Um, you know, people serve. Maybe one of the few clear ones with people served would be if you gave a seminar, you gave a talk on the self surveying you at the local garden club, and there were 30 people in attendance. Well, okay, there weren't any plans, there weren't any acres, there were 30 people. Okay, that one's pretty clear. Um, other stuff we do gets pretty nebulous. We just discussed this issue of wetland determinations. Is it the wetland or is it the tract? I could make you make pretty strong arguments either way. Um, even something as simple as you think, okay, we're out working on an equip plan. This example on your screen, one instance, 160 acres, two people. Okay, well, in, in the way business used to be done and back in the day, Mom and pop operation, you talk to the two people. They were the owners, they were the operators, they made the management decisions. Now in a lot of our farm operations, who knows, you may be talking to a land manager who's working for an owner that might be a trust that, you know, so, you know, who do you put for people served when land's owned by a land trust that has 75 people on the, that has, you know, 25 people on the board? I don't know. I don't have a great answer for you. I don't have a definitive answer for you. What I'm asking is use your best judgment. Be consistent. Be logical about it. Um, you know, we don't want to undersell what we do, but I also think we don't want to oversell what we do. Five minutes of work and 10,000 acres, that, that ratio might be a bit much. 
But again, you got to use your professional judgment, and maybe that short amount of work you put in did impact, you know, a five-county area. Well, in that case, hey, that's five counties worth of acres. For professionals, you know your job, you know what you're doing, you know who's being affected by what you do. Do the best you can and try to get us one of these three measures. As Chris will tell you, unfortunately, the economists and the people who like numbers rule a lot of the accounting, accountability business these days. And so having some numbers that we can at least feel reasonably good about when it comes to state-level reporting, national-level reporting, is a reality. Good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. This is going to be a key box for you. It's called impact. I, I'm actually thinking about or think about maybe changing the name. Um, it's strongly recommended. This is a text field that was put in the table. In my opinion, one of the most valuable places in the table. Because this is where you can explain what you did and why it was important. We're asking you to fill in a bunch of information, and yeah, you may have to kind of, it may not quite fit right in that category, but you chose category one because it was the best you had. This is where you can explain what you did. So that if you come back, if somebody asks, if you want to come back later, you can find those details. It's a free form text field. You put in the information that you need, that your boss wants to know, that's going to help somebody understand exactly what you did. Okay, last important piece, and this has got a couple slides to it, and that's that you need to populate the TSS area overlap table. The area overlap table is what's called a child table in NASA, so I'll show you a picture in a second. And um, what this allows you to do is it allows you to pick geographic areas that are where your work was done at a variety of levels, country to state to county, um, there's national. There's, there's, that's the parks in it. There's a bunch of different overlaps. What I need from the national level to do a good national report that Chris, I can send to Chris, Chris can take down the hall to the big bosses, is I need the state. I need to know whether it was in Nebraska or Nevada or Maine or Montana. Now I'm sitting here looking across, looking across the hall, across here at Neil Dominey, a state social scientist here in Nebraska. Neil may tell his people that yeah, great, you did your work in Nebraska. I kind of already knew that. Um, I'd kind of like to know what county you did your work in. Well, Neil's perfectly up to Neil. Neil says, you know, Mike wants state, I want your county too. You can do that. you got multiple overlaps. Let me show you a picture. That'll help, hopefully. As you see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you, there's a little plus minus. That's where you click to open this child table. The child table has all these areas in it, and there are little funnels that you can't quite see on the slide real well next to NASA's area type and area type name. You can use those to filter this list. This is a big, long list. It's a pain to use. So one of the things you're going to want to do when you get in is you're going to want to set up some filters. I know I've been um, talking with Ed Turley here in Nebraska, and he's thinking that, that um, he may try to work at the, as assistant state soil scientist to help people figure out how to set up those filters here in Nebraska so they can filter down to their particular area. Um, we can help you here. I, Paul Finnell said this is a classic case where if you're stuck, you can give one of the folks here at the office a call here at the NSSC and get things straightened out in pretty short order and get you the choices you need that you're going to use all the time. So, 12 steps done, and this is what it looks like. This is a completed entry. For um, for the T for a TSS activity in the state of Hawaii that meets the minimum national requirements. Now, one of the things I did with this table, if you open your NASA's right now, you're going to notice that there are other columns in this table. I used a really cool feature in NASA's called the hide column feature. You can hide the columns you don't need. And so, for instance, you notice that only the only column you see here is date completed. I hid the other three date columns. So you can set up your NASAs to only display those columns you're going to populate. This is just, just another way that it makes it easier for you to get your work done. And George had something to add.
Uh, for those of you who don't use NASAs very often, and I'm thinking of somebody in particular, uh, when you fill out one of those records and you decide that you're ready to save We're going, that's the next step we're going. George, okay. beat me to it. Okay. So we've got the, that's what it looks like, okay? You notice on this entry that, um, we're going to show you another, we're going to show you right now, 12A. And this is what George was getting at. you got to save this thing. It's not enough to enter. you got to save. Well, there's one step before, though. You have to leave the row. Oh, okay. Good point. George makes a really good point that messes people up in NASAS, that you have to click someplace else besides the row. It's a quirk in the database, but it is what it is. So you need to click someplace else beside the row, and then what you're going to see is a screen that looks like this one. In the upper left hand, in the upper left hand corner, you're going to see a little N because it's new, and you're going to see some entries. It's a two-step process to save your data in NASA. First step is you have to upload. You upload using the little floppy disk icon, which you can see the arrow pointing to, or if you're a drop-down menu kind of person, you can use drop-down menu. You know you've done this successfully when that little N up in the corner where you see the arrow pointing turns to an E. That means it's gone from a new record to an editable record. That's your clue that your save has been successful. Now, but you're not done yet. You must check in your data. Again, two-step process. It's the way the database works. It is what it is. Um, you check in using the little arrow CI icon, again, pointing to on the screen. Or you can use a pull-down menu if you're a menu-driven sort of person. And again, your clue in this, watch the letters. You're going to go from an E, and the E is going to go away. That means your data has been uploaded to the national database. Now, there are ways to get that data back out if you need to edit it later. I'm not going to talk about those today because we're short on time. But you can work with your local staff who are more NASA savvy, or you can give us a call here at the center, and we're happy to help you figure out how to do that. But I just wanted to present the basic steps right now. Always remember the saving step, because if you don't save, all this work you've just done in these first ten steps goes away. So save it, check it in. Now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. There's options to capture other information in this table besides the minimum data set I just presented. You can put the start and completion dates. Some people like that for planning. You can put a specific location. Right now, we have longitude latitude capacity or UTM. There's talk of maybe adding decimal degrees. Um, you can do multiple geographic area overlaps. I mentioned that. You may want the county. You may want the soil survey area. All I'm asking at the national level is please, please give me the state. <clears throat> um, states and MOs are going to need to work at the local level to decide what else you need locally to help um, help your state soil scientists when they walk into that state conservationist office on the 15th of September and tell a better story about the great work the TSS folks are doing in the field. How often you do this again? I'm not going to tell you how often to do this. Some people like to enter it when it gets done. You know, get the work done. Put the entry in the database, you don't forget, you just take a couple minutes, it's out of your hair. Um, other people, kind of like doing time sheets. I mean, don't people like to do the time sheet every day before they go? Some people like to do it every week, some people like to do it every two weeks. Um, we do strongly recommend, and again, I, 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 my apologies for missing the name of the person on the line um, who was doing the wetland determinations, but... You know, you can get backlogged, and so we do strongly recommend that you don't get too far behind just because then you're sitting down for an entire day entering things into NASA, which is, you know, not what not a, pretty much any of our favorite things to do. But it's good practice. That was George. That was George, the database guy, who said it was good practice. Um, <laughs> the, um, the bottom line is do what works best for you. And I personally recommend, we at the National Office recommend the states and MOs develop and issue some local guidance for what they want to do at the local level. We're not telling you what works best for you. We need the information. We need to be able to tell this story. 
how it gets there, if it gets there every day, if it gets there every week, if it gets there every two weeks. That's not, you know, you guys figure out what works for you. Once you get the information in NASA, it's in storage. You can't lose it. The beauty of national backups and stuff like that. And the table can be easily accessed and reported. Um, Paul's written, I guess there are six reports now. You can see these on the screen. Um, Paul's comment was, you want something else? I get you something else. Um, he tried to kind of catch what he thought were the most common pieces of information that people are asking for. Um, but, you know, it's once it's in the NASA's database, our good report writers here at the center, good report writers locally can extract that information and sort it in a myriad of ways. That's the advantage of having it in the, having it in the database. So, what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is that accurate and consistent TSS reporting will benefit NRCS soil scientists at all levels by providing an easily accessible record of the great work that's being done. Decision makers are asking for it, and we need to provide it. Blatant self-interest, folks. Um, if it's begging, if it's pleading, whatever it is, but I would argue it's blatant self-interest that people are asking questions and we need to have good answers. And at least for 2013 and maybe on into the future, the TSS table in NASA provides an available and an easy-to-use location to record and report. So that's the, um, it's what we got now. It's a pretty good tool. We have, um, we've got people here locally who are looking at how we can make it even better. So we need your feedback. We need your comments. We need your suggestions. Um, as usual, we are going to leave you hanging with no additional information. There's plenty of additional information out there. Um, the NASA, Paul wanted me to make sure to put a plug in for the NASA user guide, chapter 22. Um, basically, most of what I said here today, including the step-by-step -step process of how you enter data and things like that, is pretty much covered in chapter 22. So when you've forgotten everything I said because you went off and did what your real job is, you can go back and check that out. The um, Technical Soil Services Handbook was put together under Chris's. When Chris was sitting in this chair with a lot of work from Chris, Lenore, and a whole bunch of other people, um, that's available on the web, kind of everything you want to know about TS, uh, technical soil services, but we're afraid to ask. And then if you want the nitty-gritty of where this all comes from, from the policy perspective and all that good stuff, if you um, want to read the details in, NASA, in um, the National Soil Survey Handbook, Part 655, that's where they are. So, um, so anyway, that's my obligatory tropical picture. For, as most of you probably know, or some of you may not, I am... Um, Moved here in Lincoln just shy of two years ago now from Honolulu, Hawaii, in a fit of insanity. Um, and uh, Cynthia Stiles was just uh, is on this teleconference telling me how gorgeous it is in Honolulu. Um, but uh, so it goes. Anyway, this is my obligatory Tropic Island picture. And um, we've got a few more minutes. I think we've had some questions typed in that uh, Sean will read out. I will try to answer. And then if others have questions, we'll try to get those get to those too. So, Sean, what do we got? Okay, we got a question about clarifying the, uh, the time spent column in the tech soil services table. Do you have some kind of idea that that will be, when that will be added? Ah, the time spent the hours column. Yes, there is a, there's a plan to add an hours column into the TSS table. Um, my understanding, and I'm looking straight at George when I say this, uh, my understanding is that that will be in the next update, so NASA 6.2 point something. Um, and I believe that's due out sometime in the Early spring was what I had been told, but I'm looking at George. Is that still the tentative timetable? Uh, it's planned for right around the time Web Soil Survey 3.0 comes out, which right now is probably pretty close to the 1st of February. Okay, so if, anybody, if you weren't able to hear that, um, George says that uh, the plan is that that would come out concurrent with the new Web Soil Survey around the 1st of February. Um, keep in mind we're working with agency IT here. And um, just keep that in mind. And then we have some questions here about uh, how the reporting information gets into the hands of leadership in Congress, and who's primarily responsible for that. Um, how do we? Okay, for those of you who heard, um, national reporting. Um, what we're what what we've done in the past, and what we plan to continue to do, is that some um, information is collected at the national level. There's a call for there's a, um, a call for information at the end of the year. We hope to be able, that's one reason why we're pushing reporting in 6.2. 
that we can harvest that information so we don't have to bother you for it. It's already there. Um, that information is summarized here at NSC and up at NHQ. Um, Chris, and his, Chris has done that in the past. I'll be taking the leadership on the summarizing part. In my, now that I'm wearing the tech services hat, um, Chris, in his position as senior scientist, is, um, has been our main liaison, our main you know, man, on the, man on the ground there in D.C., who's the person who um, report, summary reports are prepared. We didn't do one this year in any, to any extent because we looked at our data and said, you know, we just don't feel comfortable, you know, waving this from the flagpole. Well, you know, and that's part of why I'm, that's a big part of the reason why I'm here today. Is, there, oh, this is the, you know, and like Chris can talk about what I've done in the past, so go ahead, Chris. Well, actually, there was, uh, I put together an abbreviated report, you know, looking at what we could tease out of, of, of who did report, you know, out of the 15 states, and made it clear to say, hey, this is 15 states worth of data, but this gives an indication of the breadth and the magnitude of what's going on out there. Um, and, and this was a, a bit of a white paper. It went into, there's a couple places it went. One is there is a, a weekly update that all the deputy areas provide to the chief, is seen by the deputy chief, the uh, regional cons, and the, uh, the chief and the deputy chief and the regional cons are primarily up here. And so that abbreviated report did go into advertised tech services. There's a white paper report that the chief gets through um, Mike Golden. And that's the extent of where the report went. So top leadership is aware that we're out there and we're doing things. We have had some discussions with our OMB examiner um, about reporting this. And uh, he's saying, well, you know, that, that might, we might want to see that. So keep that information in, in, in hand. But right now, when we send a report from the agency to OMB, it does not have tech services in it. But um, if, if you have any clue or have had people talk about the way things work around here, tomorrow that could change. <laughs> so, um, and they always give you to close a business at most to come up with your data. It's like speak now or forever will be. So uh, having the data in hand is always at hand. Uh, is, is what we want to uh, be able to do so that we get additional requests, further elucidation of what the agency is doing. We can, we can grab our document and run. So that's what happened this year. So it, 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 it was basically a white paper report, uh, weekly report to the chief. So thanks. Okay. Um, some other questions here. I'm just sitting here with Sean. Um, a request from Virginia, Minnesota about some national guidance, and I think that's a really good point. Um, the, um, the minimum data set is what is here in the webinar. Um, some examples, we can certainly work on those and get that out to everybody. Um, no, I understand the need, and it, you know, I, again, it, these quantitative measures are going to be extremely difficult to develop specific guidance on just because of the work we do is so, is so varied. But we'll try to pull together some examples and get that out to you folks. In the meantime, the minimum data set I presented today is the national minimum data set. That's not going to change. Um, if states want to add to that, that's great. But we are strongly requesting that everybody provide at least that minimum amount of information. Um, a, a couple of questions about the instances. And then how that relates to the web TCAS reporting. Yeah. Um, instances is a tough one. Um, I'm not super comfortable personally with instances. I like things reported separately. I think it's cleaner that way. I think the way people, my understanding of the way people were using instances was for um, what used to be called in the old PRS reporting brief technical consultations, um, where somebody calls on the phone. I think that's pretty, that's kind of where people were using instances. Um, in my mind, I think that everything we do is likely varied enough. That and yeah, you're doing wetland determinations, but they're gonna you're doing yes, you're doing two wetland determinations. Yes, that's two wetland determinations, but one's in X county, one's in Y county. One was on 20 acres of forest land. One was on 15 acres of pasture land. And I don't think that lumping those together as two instances of wetland determination really tells us much, and it doesn't help us 
tell the story that we want to tell about the amount and variety of work that we're doing. Um, hope that helps. What else we got? There's a question here as, as it relates to the web TCAS hours and will there be a comparison between what's in web TCAS per hours and what's in the TSS report and NASA's per hours? Um, I can't imagine somebody going to that much trouble. Um, <laughs> the um, but, you know, the, the point, I, I do think that one of the, and again, we, this decision has not been made to my knowledge, but I think that one of the impetuses, if that's the right word, behind adding hours into NASIS was a way to document that, how that 15% of time was being spent by the MLRA SSO staff. Now, I don't think, I, I'm i certainly not going to be looking at, you know, 0 0.25, you know, that somebody's spending you know, exactly whatever that is, 50% of 40, so that's, what, six hours a week. You know, I'm not going to be looking for that. I don't think anybody else is going to be looking at that specific level. But, you know, as, as you're all aware, there was a lot of a lot of politics and a lot of negotiation that went into the reorganization plan. Um, part of that were some big concerns by the state conservationists that they were losing soils assistance. And one of the decisions that was made by the Soil Science Division, and, and Dave mentioned it at the beginning of the, of the, of the webinar, the division's continuing commitment to TSS. And one of the things the division very deliberately did in the reorg was put our, put our money, your, your hours, where our mouth was, and put, went back to the state cons and said, hey, we're not. You know, these folks, yes, they're not working for Soil Survey Division, but they have 15% time, of their time working on TSS. And so is it going to be a track to the minute? I, I dearly hope not, personally. I don't, we're all professionals. I don't think anybody needs to be managed that way. Are people going to be looking at big, broad numbers and trying to see that that comes out something close to 15%? Um, that might happen. I don't, again, I can't, my crystal ball is broken, so. As a follow-up to that, there's another related question about um, how to charge time and web PCAS for MLRA, so survey offices staff, when they're attached to say, District of Columbia, yeah. but doing technical service somewhere else. Oh, darn, darn good question. That would be Roy.Vic at um, <laughs> WDC. Let me get this off me right now. <laughs> um, but no, that's, but I, I mean, you testified to your that's what I'm, I'm assuming. Not natural, it just said, I mean, you plan your I don't think we're going to change anything on how business has been done in the past, but, but I'm going to tease and roll a little bit. But I, there are some you know, operational decisions that, with this reorganization, are going to have to be decided. And, you know, I, I, I have, fun, have fun giving Roy a little grief about this, but I mean, there are some things that just, you know, devil's going to be in the details, and it's going to take a bit of time to, to shake out those details. There's a question that's come up about how do you enter the coordinates for your, your activity when, when it's linear. So something like an FBPA corridor project. That's Rick. Highway. That's that's Rick Robbins' question. Ah, oh. um, Rick and I used to work together, so I can give Rick a little grief. Um, my my I, my thought with that would be that you probably wouldn't try to enter something at that at that level of detail. You'd enter a county or a set of counties or a um, you know, some sort of broader geographic distinction, and you wouldn't try to get down to that um to that kind of level of detail. So there's a question here, has anyone tried to enter uh, the TSS reporting using NASIS in disconnected mode? Huh, darn, darn good question. <laughs> I have not. I, we're getting a bunch of shake, shaking of heads here in Lincoln. Any, anybody on the line try it? Hmm, well, I guess somebody will have to give it a try and let us all know. Yeah. So there's a question about uh, why, are we, why aren't we using another tool like PRS? Um, why aren't we using PRS? Uh, that's because <laughs> that's a Chris question. Yeah. They didn't want that level of detail. Uh, they're they're really, uh, as they say up here, uh, flying at the thirty thousand foot level on a lot of this reporting. Um, so this is way too far in the weeds for them. Okay. Um, somebody asked where the webinar will be stored. Shall I be sending out an email to everyone with the link? Actually, I sent it out. So if you got the coordinates for this email, that was in the webinar announcement. So I'll just tell everybody it's on online at webinars, presentations, and training sessions. And the URL is soils.usda.gov slash education slash resources slash videos dot 
HTML. So we've got all those on there. Uh, right now they're on our center's FTP site. Uh, anybody in the worldwide international audience can get to those. And uh, when we get the software available and working for us to convert those to a YouTube format, and the closed captioning worked out, we'll be posting those on our YouTube channel. This will be perhaps more publicly available then. But right now, anyone, you can be in some other country and you can get to those uh, archived webinars and presentations now. Um, one little note, and somebody brought this up, um, a comment was put in, and I'd just like to echo it, that, um, that that's, I, the, this input, te the impact text field is a free form field. And so if you feel like you want to start keeping track of hours and we don't have the, and the hours column's not going to be there until January or February, um, you can always note the hours in that, um, in that text field. So that, you know, that, that's where you can, like, like I say, that's where you can put that additional information that doesn't fit within, the, doesn't fit neatly in the little boxes. So I, I'd encourage folks to, you know, feel free to use that and, and that can be a record, you know, if you need to go back, figure out what happened or, um, yeah, that kind of thing. That's that's the point of that field being there. All right, well, Marie, there's been some excellent questions. We have gone over time, but I would entertain one more question if there's one over the phone. If someone's brave enough to uh, ask it, can we take one more question. All right. Well, I guess. All right. Again, thanks again, folks. We have gone a little over time. And I do apologize for that, but I appreciate you hanging in. Um, this will be available on the web. So, um, and any questions, don't be shy. Let us know. We're trying to make this better. Have a great one.